It's the show. Hey Sam, do you know what they say about cliffhangers? So, being as I'm only 16 and Maud is only 12, neither of us work and, based on the complaining that Braun and Corbin do about their jobs, neither of us are really looking forward to working either. It's kind of depressing to think that eventually you're going to be stuck spending a third of your days hanging around people who probably don't really like you that much, doing things that you probably don't agree with that much for people who definitely don't really respect you that much. But what if you could rebel? Take down your place of employment from the inside, or at least take ownership over what you do to surreptitiously climb the ranks and take over? Midboss is a new procedurally generated turn-based dungeon crawler by Kitsune Games that lets you do just that. There are a number of aspects to Midboss that make it different to its genre friends, most notably the core mechanic, which sees you possessing your enemies, taking over their corpses to utilise their abilities to your advantage in order to achieve your ultimate goal, showing those jerky jerk jerk face monsters that you're cool and awesome and you can do good things if they just give you a chance and you're going to be the new boss if you have to kill every last one of them. <clears throat> Given that Midboss is designed to be a challenging experience, it is wonderful to see the sheer number of accessibility items that have been included. I don't have enough time to go into everything, but jeez do I want to. Seriously, I am in love with the accessibility options that Midboss has. Like, right off the bat, you're given the option to customise the controls, which you should know by now is a pet thing for me. And there's a colourblind mode, and each of the game's options has a meaningful tooltip, and like, there are just so many small fry things, and these are, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Impressively, Midboss has some great accessibility features that are considered advanced by a lot of standards. A lot of the options allow you to tweak various aspects of the game's difficulty, which is so much better than just having a vanilla, easy, medium, hard selection, because different players will struggle with different aspects. The feature that probably impressed and surprised me the most though is the queasy safe mode. This feature toggles the sound effects and animations for things that players might find gross or perhaps inappropriate for younger players, such as blood and guts and stuff. The child safe mode is a nice bonus, but what this has a great use for is people with, for example, emetophobia, because this mode explicitly states that it removes all visual and audio references to barfing within mid-boss. There's so much to mid-boss that is great for someone with ADHD as well, like it's hella challenging, so you feel a great sense of accomplishment when you manage to get even a little bit further, but it's more than the challenge. Midboss has a feature called Death Cards, PNG images that not only tell you a little story about your play session, but that also have encoded within them all of the stats about said play session, down to each item you held in your inventory when you met your demise. These Death Cards let you not only share information about your play session with others over social media, but they also let you load the information into your own game and gain advantage in your future play sessions from it such as the ability to take an item from a couple of failed runs with you in your new run. I have never seen this mechanic before, and I've never seen a mechanic implemented in such a novel manner. I am in love. Midboss released on the 26th of May, and it will cost you a measly $14. If you're a fan of dungeon crawlers, or you're looking for something new in the fantasy genre to play, especially something with interesting new mechanics, then pause this video and go and buy it right now. It definitely tastes like pickles. <laughs>
my people, it's Braun here, and we're gonna do another stream of consciousness race from some topic to some other topic, going via the yellow brick road of interconnected facts. You'll learn something, I'll learn something, I'll get to talk a whole bunch, I'll forget to edit because heck, how does my brain even work anyway? It's great, you love it. Today, our start and endpoints came from Darkus Kale on Twitter and Corvus, who I found on the mostly unheard of social media website, Twitter. We start our journey today at the archaeological term, tell. The word tell comes from the Arabic for hill, or mound, and is a substantial man-made bump in the earth that happens when a society has lived in a place for so long, like hundreds and thousands of years, that all of their dead stuff just kind of piles up on top of itself like a big old corpse mountain. Except it's not just people corpses, it's also like house corpses and stuff. Like how they built New New York on top of regular New York in Futurama. People must really love that New New York bit, because it appears in media every 10 years from the 1950s onwards. The most recent is in Doctor Who in the 2000s, although there it was New 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 York. The original though, and of course the best, was in Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles. There's a song about Ray Bradbury, you know, by a singer called Rachel Bloom. It got nominated for a Hugo Award in 2011 for Best Dramatic Presentation Short Form. It's called, and I am sorry for the swear here, Fuck Me, Ray Bradbury. And you can probably guess what it's about from the title. Bradbury himself even got shown the song and the accompanying film clip on his 90th birthday by Mark Edward, who said that Ray found it charming, and oh how they laughed. Well, chuckled. Mark Edward, for those of you who don't know, is a mentalist, which is kind of like a mind magician, kind of like Mentok, the mind taker, from Birdman and the Galaxy Trio, although to be honest, his best showing was as Judge Mentok, the mind taker, boo -wee! in Harvey Birdman Attorney at Law, which was a spin-off of Space Ghost Coast to Coast, which was the first fully produced Cartoon Network series. The first fully produced Nickelodeon series, on the other hand, was Rocco's Modern Life, although the animation studio part was called Games Animation back then. As for the Disney Channel, well, obviously that's a bit harder to do, seeing as how Disney has been a thing for longer than premium subscription television services. But I do know that the Disney Channel first became a thing on the 18th of April 1983, and the first series ever run on it was Good Morning Mickey. But of course, most people, probably everyone, knows Disney for their feature films. They've made 56 so far, starting with Snow White all the way up to Moana. And something they love to do is put references to their other movies inside their other movies. Like Beast showing up in Aladdin, or the Genie's Magic Lamp showing up in Princess and the Frog, or the Pelt of Scar from Lion King showing up in Hercules. And speaking of Hercules, the two little demons Pain and Panic are voiced by two of my favorite voices, Bobcat Goldthwaite for Pain and Matt Frewer for Panic. And Matt Frewer, by the way, was originally going to be a hockey player, so if it wasn't for an accident when he was 15, we wouldn't have had the voice of Jackal on Gargoyles. And that is where I had to try and get to the fact that Matt Frewer voiced Jackal on Gargoyles, and I did it! So, suck it! Destination reached, baby! Bada bum bum, bada bum bum. He's not dancing, look.